This time at the Spitfire factory, owner Peter Monk has lots of balls in the air. Morning, Richard. After a slow start, he needs work on their most important Spitfire restoration project to move up a gear. We're heading towards some pivotal moments with the final assemblies. His team historian Robin is planning a special veterans lunch at the hangar. One is even 100, so he will need definitely need an easy chair. And he has his annual family holiday to plan. It's the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and Peter plans to be there with all his boys and all his toys, including one of his Spitfires. But just like the real D-Day, the weather may have a role to play. It's been over a year since Spitfire MJ755 arrived back in the UK from Greece to be restored to flying condition. After months of painstaking preparation, assembly of both the fuselage and the wings is well underway. But now they have just eight months left to finish it. Today, the team is preparing the fuselage for a trip to the paint shop. Exciting times for 21-year-old trainee Alex Monk the boss's oldest son, because this is his first major restoration project. We're just plugging up the last holes on it and putting in the last rivets, and what will happen is it will go over to the paint shop. Yeah. And so far, so good, it's actually pretty smooth. So you probably won't even see half of those rivets when you get some paint on it. So if you can get that look, then it normally looks pretty slick because the whole airplane looks like one piece. On the first Spitfires, designer RJ Mitchell used a combination of flush and rounded rivets. Testing showed that using more expensive flush rivets on aerodynamic surfaces could increase speed by 22 miles an hour. Alex has personally fixed about half of the 15,000 odd rivets used so far. There's now about 65,000 or so to go. He's learning the ropes under the watchful eye of Chief Engineer Franco. 15 months work ready now to uh, get it painted. And the uh, next stage, we'll get it all kitted out. Wait a minute, I think they're gonna drop it in a minute. <laughs> the skin of a Spitfire is not just smooth, it's also extremely thin. This is the skin of a wing. You can see the paint on it. It's 22 gauge. They would have used what we call geralium, which has more copper in it. We use now aircraft grade aluminium. If we I'm have to not replace going him. up in that. It's hilarious. <laughs> now, if you've had a misspent use, such as I, where you've been dealing with air rifles, you know full well that's going to go straight through it. Never mind a cannon shell or a machine gun bullet. The wing of a Spitfire is its most famous feature. Elliptically shaped, tapering in thickness towards the tips. It's the key to the aircraft's aerobatic performance. But what's going on under that thin metal skin? Not many original wartime wings have survived, but they do make new ones here at the Spitfire factory. Engineers Duncan and Mark take around six months to build a single wing. There was a lot of pride in all of this. An awful lot of work goes into it. And when it when it goes right, you can actually sit back and uh, feel quite pleased with yourself. At the moment, they're working on a new wing for a Spitfire being restored in Norway. The framework is complete and the skin is going on. Inside each wing, over 1,000 individual parts are riveted together to form a rigid lightweight box, which gradually flattens towards the wing tips. In some places, the skin is just 0.6 millimetres thick which is about six sheets of paper. Today's task is to make and attach just one of the 16 skin panels. You start with the skin, you start in the centre, and you just work out, so that way you, you stretch the skin as you go, so you get a nice flat finish once it's all done. Right now, they're lining it up for drilling and pinning. The rivets will come later. Right, you can give us a lift up, I've got the ladder, try and position it up there. Ugh, right, it's gonna have to come up. Slightly. Twist it to you a little bit. That way. That way, yeah. Yeah. A bit more or not? That is about right there. This is a bit like tailoring. Um, you've got patterns. 
Um, and we make, just make out of metal, really. So we've got land in there, landing through there. Have another look. Yeah, I've got, I've got my edge distance there on there. When the position is perfect, they can drill. And temporary pins lock it in place. So all I'm doing is just pinning as we go. But it wasn't always possible to build wings with so much time and care. 80 years ago, they needed to produce new Spitfires more quickly than they were being shot down. It would have been exactly the same skills as, as we've got. They would have been doing it under a lot more pressure, a lot quicker. These are um, machines that are worth millions of pounds now, so we take our time and do it to the best we possibly can. Many factory workers were women, without any previous training. Women during the war, when or the, the, what they built and the, the rate they built it, phenomenal, really. On the rivet gun, like you've just heard, um, they, were, they probably had a more delicate touch. OK, then, Mark, you don't need me anymore, do you? No, that's, that's all, all good. That's now. all held. Yeah. Another new wing nearly finished, but the Greek Spitfire's wings have been much more challenging. A restored wartime wing is a very different beast to a new one. This was made for 80 years ago, so... Um, and you can tell it's been mass produced. That's near to breaking through, and then it pitches back in again. So it's almost, it's almost wavy through. Nowadays, we, would, we, wouldn't, we wouldn't do that. We would, we would be pitched in, equus spaced, um, straight lines, but not knocking it, under a lot of pressure, being bombed regularly. Back then, it was get them flying, defend the island, and that's, how, that's what we've done. The boss is determined to use as much of the original wing as possible. This particular one, it's been a number of years outside, which took its toll on the, on the aircraft. The condition of it has become very poor. Every panel and piece of frame has been dismantled, stripped of paint, and where possible, reused. Authenticity is priceless, and there's one section that Peter's especially excited about. This wing has all of the components for installing the machine guns. Now, it's rare to see all of this, almost unheard of, but it's all there in its entirety. If we were to put a machine gun into this position, clamp it into place, bullets in the, in the ammunition box, these guns would operate exactly as they would have done. As the role of the Spitfire changed over time, the wings got chunkier, so they could carry bigger and more powerful weapons. Each of the Greek Spitfire's wings was fitted with one eight-foot-long 20mm cannon and two Browning machine guns, which could fire at a rate of 1,150 rounds per minute, but only had enough ammo for a couple of short bursts, totalling about 15 seconds. The cannon and the machine gun, which were fitted in this position, are fed by these rollers here through the drums which are fitted in this position. There's a, so there's a, 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 the um, belts fitted in here for the smaller calibre gun. We go around this side of the wing. The bullets are actually stored in a box, an ammunition box, one of which goes here and one of which goes there. So here we have the, the, these are the unrestored ammunition boxes. You can see the marks there where the bullets laid in there would have run along the bottom before running round here and out through there into the machine gun. So you can see that this one's actually been used. In a few weeks time, this meticulously restored wing will be ready to go back on the aircraft. But first, that fuselage needs a paint job. Are you steering at the front and I'll steer the back? Go on, Frank, get that drift on. After World War II, the Greek Air Force bought over 200 RAF Spitfires, many of which fought in the Greek Civil War. This is the only survivor, and soon it will bear its unique Greek Air Force paint scheme once more. We're on a taxiway right now, and because we're on a live airfield, we need to uh, get an escort from a truck so people can see us. They don't have to go far because Biggin Hill has a paint shop on site. Which is just as well because they're a little short on power. That engine's only got three horsepower today. One, two, three. Oh no, four horsepower. 
For the paint shop team, it must make a nice change from respraying corporate jets. The base material is really thick, so to get everything to mix together it is just quite tough to start with. This is the colour scheme it's going to be painted in, like it was back in 1953, the last time this aircraft flew. Instead of having classic red, white and blue RAF roundels, they will be in Greek Air Force white and blue. When it's finished, it should um, come out of here looking like that. All nicely painted. When they're painting the camo, they, they do sort of both colours at the same time. So the Greek Air Force gave us the paint code. Now we've had them mixed by RAS. Once that's painted, they will come over and look at the aircraft and say, yep, we're happy with it, or no, it needs to be repainted. With the pattern mapped out, creating the soft lines between colours is a fine art. So we just need to sort a few bits out that aren't quite right with the camouflage, but generally pretty good. Chuck said. It's a new day at the Spitfire factory and two-seater flights are underway. Today, World War II veterans have been invited to the hangar for a special D-Day celebration. We're extremely patriotic here. It's a big day for team historian Robin Brooks. We're expecting about 12 veterans, which is uh, quite a good selection of, of guys, um, all of them well into their 90s. One is even 100, so he will need definitely need an easy chair. We've got the jeeps there for them to create the atmosphere of D-Day. We're hoping to fly one in the MJ-772 today. MJ-772 is a newly restored Mark IX Spitfire that took part in D-Day 75 years ago. During the Normandy campaign, she was flown by a free French squadron. Here is an original photograph of 341, the Alsac Free French Squadron, which was taken at RAF Merston just prior to D-Day. I'm going to put this on the Jeep. All set to go. And the first to arrive is rifleman Ken Hay. I'm just shaking the hand of a true gentleman. Ken fought in Normandy, where he was captured, operating behind enemy lines. I'm the only army here, no, right? we'll have two of you here, good. which is good. So you'll have company. They're, they're all breath yeah. jobs over here, aren't they? All blue jobs. Mainly, yeah, yeah. blue cream boys. Of course. <laughs> Hello, Alan. Hello. I'm very pleased to meet you again. Spitfire ace Alan Scott is a veteran of the 1943 Malta campaign, with six confirmed kills to his name. Squadron leader Jack Lawrence was a wireless operator shot down in 1943, who famously escaped the Nazis three times and George Dunn, the new local hero, since the team found out he flew their Greek Spitfire in 1947. I think it's very important that we can uh, gather these people together and get their stories while we can. The Heritage Hangar, as you know, we are always pleased to have your veterans here, and today is extremely special because we do have an aircraft that actually flew over the DJ beaches, flown by Sergeant Habib, and we are extremely pleased to have the French Air Attaché here. It's our tribute to all you gentlemen who did so much for all of us during the war. And we are very, very pleased to have you, and long may it continue. OK, so thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Can I have the French Air Attaché in the middle, please? Photo op completed, it's time to fly. 97-year-old Spitfire reconnaissance pilot John Musselwhite is going up in the Spitfire while other veterans get to watch from the air. John last flew a Spitfire in 1946 and once in the air, he'll get to take the controls again. Never too old for a barrel roll. Great experience, 
I've not been up in a two-seater Spitfire before. That was something. <laughs> well, I was thrilled when uh, Robin asked me whether I would like to go out. Have a safe journey home and enjoy your birthday next week. <laughs> it's been a great start to the Spitfire Factory's D-Day anniversary celebrations. They've all gone home happy and uh, that's what we like. And a taxi's here. Back at home, Peter's taking a morning off to plan his annual trip to Normandy. Have a good day. Yeah, will do. Bye. 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 This is where his Spitfire Empire began, 25 years ago. Since then, he's restored 10 Spitfires and accumulated thousands of spare parts, many of which are still in the garage. But wife Linda really wants somewhere to keep her car. This is where Pete has kept all the spit bits for many years. Many dark evenings, you spend him rummaging in here, looking for bits. I don't know what he does in here. Every so often, Linda tries to have a clear out. It looks like scrap metal to me. I mean, in the past, I've been doing a tip run and found bits and bobs in the, um, the room next door, and I've loaded it into the car to take up the tip. And Pete's come home and said, what are you doing with that? So it comes back out the car and back into here again. I don't like mess, not mess like this. It's just part of Pete, it's just the way he is. He's never going to change. It's just, um, yeah, it's just mess. Peter has been summoned to face the music. Oh, do you know how much stuff you've got in here? Well, to be honest with you, I thought I'd move, move most of it out, but... It's like um, buried treasure. Do you know what's all in these boxes? No, no. What about all the stuff that you keep buying off eBay? Haven't you got the stuff here? Probably. Do, well, do you ever look at stuff when you get it? Or do you just put it on a shelf and then that's it? Well, no, I mean, the, 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 the part number's on the box, tells you what it is, and if it's a sealed box, I'd, I want to leave it sealed until we, until we need it. Look at this. What's that? But you don't even know what that is. There you are, look, part number there, 5C449, terminal blocks. Yeah. And there's 10 in there. So you don't need any more? Linda's not making much headway. Okay. Not to be opened until required for use. Okay. Even though it was packed in 1951. <laughs> <laughs> to put it back, okay, okay. it was quite safe where it was. But just looking at it, it's, yeah, it's, uh, uh, Oh, is he wavering? I just had a little moment there. I think, actually, it's all bloody junk. <laughs> <laughs> but it oh, isn't. Like, can it go in the skip, yeah, then? no way is it going in the skip. <laughs> Final score. Part sent to the skip. Zero. Zero, dear. A mess. And it looks like Linda's car will be staying in the drive for quite a bit longer. Back at the hangar, the Greek Spitfire is back from the paint shop, looking sharp. Here it is then, finally in its, in its livery, complete with the squadron codes and all. What do you think? It looks good to me. It looks pretty neat, actually. It's, it's straight, there's no wrinkles in it, there's no ripples in it really, and so as far as the Spitfire fuselage goes, I think it's come out really well. Now, Alex can crack on with the next stage. This is the original throttle, I haven't done anything with it yet, hence why she's looking a bit dusty. So at the moment, just been fiddling around with the, uh, the throttle linkages. So it's got a, um, a link that comes out of here, which is attached to the throttle in the cockpit. And you do that to open and shut the throttle to put more air and fuel in. This one controls the propeller, that one controls the throttle, and this one does the fuel cut off, which you just use for stopping the engine. And then this would sit, Right here, like that. Two bolts that hold it in the top and a couple in the bottom. Alex has to pass the throttle linkage through a crucial element in the fuselage. In the heart of the Spitfire, frame five is where the engine mount, fuselage and wings all attach. It's also a firewall between the engine and the main fuel tank. The throttle controls are just one of several systems that must be threaded through this barrier. Here would be the engine, and then at the back of the engine is the carburetor. Just checking it all lines up and is um, moving smoothly. 
If it's all notchy, you'll feel it and it won't be very nice to fly. As you do that, pushes this forwards, which moves this here. Bit of grease in there to make sure it is all right and um, just a bit of fettling. So take it on, put it off, see where it's been rubbing, see where it hasn't and just get it moving how I want it. The fettling bits I enjoy a bit more. Yeah, this is quite therapeutic. I put a, a coating on it and I can see where it's been moving and it will rub because that's what, there's a little guide here which it rubs on. But yeah, I can see where it's been making contact. So I'm pretty happy with how that runs. This is the original hardware off of it. So that goes through here like that. The spacer goes on here like this. And then I push it back through just gently, slip it back, line it in there, jiggle it around a bit until it goes in. And we'll just whack a washer on to save me paint. And then we put a nut on there like that. And then that's hooked up. When the pilot gets in there to fly it, he'll grab hold of different pieces and you'll go, I've done that, and it's nice. Alex is now one small step closer to seeing the Greek Spitfire back in the air. It's five days until the 75th anniversary of the D-Day landings. Across the channel in Normandy, a huge event has been planned to commemorate the anniversary. Peter plans to take two of his sons, and he's hoping one of his pilots will be able to fly out their D-Day Spitfire, MJ-772. What will be the icing on the cake is if we're able to find some agile veterans that we can fly along the beaches on the 5th and the 6th, and hopefully the 7th, before they bring the aircraft back to Biggin Hill. 55 squadrons of Spitfires took part in the Normandy invasion. With limited resistance from the Luftwaffe, the Spitfire was given a variety of roles. High altitude reconnaissance missions to photograph enemy positions. Ground attack missions against gun emplacements and enemy vehicles. And some were used as spotters for Allied warships as they targeted coastline defences. Peter will need clear flying conditions to get his Spitfire out and back. So, like the Allied generals in June 1944, he's going to be watching the weather very closely. Put this 100% cloud cover all the way down the, the coast there, which isn't much help to us at all. But Peter's not the only one preparing for D-Day. At Duxford Airfield in Cambridgeshire, a small fleet of these aircraft has been assembling. And in a couple of days' time, Spitfire factory pilot Peter Kinsey will be flying one. So, he's come to check it out. Well, it's very original. Um, I'm not sure it's been painted since 1943. The table we're looking at here is the navigator's table. He had instruments here which duplicated some of the, the pilot's instruments and the light to shine on his, on his maps there. Opposite him on the other side is the radio operator's um, seat. This was one of Eisenhower's four machines that won the war an iconic transport plane known in Britain as the Dakota. Developed from the Douglas DC-3 airliner, they could operate from short runways and were used to airlift supplies and troops to the front lines. On D-Day, they were famous for towing gliders and dropping paratroopers. Twelve people will stand up and they will jump out one after the other. And because they had to land them in a very small area, so they were all together when they landed, they jump with about a one-second gap approximately between each one, and no one can hesitate. So the jump master's job is, if anyone does hesitate, just to put his foot in the middle of their back and kick them out, because there can't be any delay at all. On the 5th of June, these vintage aircraft will recreate the mass paratrooper drops of D-Day, weather permitting. Back at Biggin Hill, Alex is preparing his own invasion force, an original piece of paratrooper kit. So this is an Excelsior well bike. It's a fold-up scooter type thing that was used by the paratroopers in the Second World War. This would be dropped with them on a separate parachute in a canister. Canister would open up, fold the bike out and ride off in theory. Roads have bumps in them and potholes, and this only has tiny little wheels and no suspension. Bit of a git to start, don't start very well. It's got no gears, it's got one brake. They're not brilliant, like, as an idea it was good. It just didn't carry it out very well. At least we've got the banjo bolt fits now, does it? Yeah, what I've pulled is left to do on the other one. So, it wasn't exactly our finest hour. But Alex is keen to take it anyway. If he can get it running. 
you wouldn't want to be doing this in the early hours of the morning in German-occupied Normandy. At another restoration workshop, another merry band of engineers is attempting to restore another unsung hero of the Normandy campaign. The near forgotten Hawker Typhoon. But they've not got much to work with. This is the largest original lump of a typhoon extant anywhere other than the complete example in the RAF Museum in Hendon. So we've got the rear cone of the fuselage with us, which we're stripping down. The skins, the outer surface, obviously, is too far gone. All around the roundel, that's completely scrap. So what we have to establish now, by removing all the skins, is how good the structure internally is. The frames on the inside, we hope, will be mostly usable certainly repairable in many cases. And the idea is to try and salvage every single thing that we can. Steve is hoping to restore what's left of this plane to become the world's only flying typhoon. And his team will do whatever it takes to save each individual part. We can remake things like this, but that sort of defeats the object of respiration. Yeah. If we can save this, then, you know, yeah. it's... It is what it is. It's, it, this has done the business. It's flown. It's, it's been there. Yeah. So, we're going to have a go at dressing that out. So, we put it in the oven and, yeah, hopefully, hopefully it will go. The oven is used to soften the metal at over 500 degrees so that Jake can literally hammer it back into shape. <laughs> Raising the money to restore the Typhoon is also a monumental task. We're going to raise five million and we're going to rebuild a typhoon to fly. I mean it, and I'm going to bloody make sure it happens. Originally designed as an interceptor, the typhoon couldn't compete with the latest German fighters. But it did prove a very stable low-level gun platform. Armed with rockets, it became the RAF's most lethal ground attack aircraft. A vital role as the Allies fought their way back across Western Europe. But in Britain, its memory has been eclipsed for a simple reason. The Spitfire was in the Battle of Britain, which was in the skies overhead the UK. So people saw what it was doing firsthand. The typhoon made its name in Normandy. And on the continent, the French, the Dutch, the Belgians, they can't get enough of the typhoon. There are memorials everywhere. There are plaques. The streets are named after their pilots, everything. Yet yeah, over here, most people don't know what a typhoon is. Sam has enlisted veteran pilot Bernard Gardner to help his cause. In May 1944, Bernard was a 21-year-old pilot in 257 Squadron when he first flew a typhoon. It was quite daunting, really, because uh, we suddenly had a much heavier aeroplane altogether, much more powerful. And it's quite darn daunting to sit in the cockpit and realize that I'm going to have to fly this thing. It absolutely leapt into the air with that uh, 2,000 horsepower Sabre engine. At full power, the aeroplane, it re really was straining at leash. These were uh, fitted with eight rocket rails. The rockets were underneath the wing there. They all went out with a, a very loud whoosh as they, as they fired. In Normandy, the typhoon proved devastatingly effective. Rommel, I said, uh, the reason the Allies won at Normandy was because of the typhoon. He said none of his troops, his armor, could move during the day in good weather. They were just effectively stopped in their tracks because of the typhoon. We probably approach it at something like 2,000 feet and, um, and then a dive down along the trenches. The typhoon, of course, very fast and it gets over 500 miles an hour in a dive. I can't remember ever feeling fear going into the operation at all. In the workshop, Jake's been hammering away on that frame section for hours. 
there's still a slight gap under there. So we need to basically try and pull that out a little bit further. One false move, one stray hammer blow, and it's game over. You can get it to a certain stage where you think, oh yeah, we're going to be able to reuse this. And then one tap of the hammer and all of a sudden a crack appears and then you can't use it. A day's work to rescue one part. And the price tag of five million to get this aircraft flying starts to make sense. It's basically priceless to us. This will be the best memorial that you could possibly have to the crews that flew and died in the typhoon. After the war, Bernard and his squadron flew their typhoons back to England, where they were scrapped and forgotten. Very sad to see so many lovely aeroplanes just being destroyed because they, they'd finished their operational use and that was it. It just disappeared into obscurity. It was just forgotten about completely. It's a unique uh, restoration project. There will not, I'm sure, be another typhoon restored to airworthy status. It'll be several years, admittedly, but, um, but ultimately it will be the world's only airworthy typhoon. I would love to come and see it um, actually flying and, 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 see and, and hear it too. This typhoon isn't going to make it to the 75th anniversary of D-Day, but it might just be there for the 80th. For more than one full year, there poured into Great Britain a torrent of war implements. Tanks, guns, weapons beyond description. And men, American soldiers, at the rate of 150,000 every month. In June 1944, thousands of trucks and trains were loaded up for D-Day. And today, Peter and his boys are loading up their truck for their trip to Normandy, including another of Eisenhower's war-winning machines. Both these Jeeps are wartime Jeeps. It's relevant that we take them over. There'll be lots of others, so we'll, uh, we'll mingle in with the rest. We've got the canvas top on this one which is the one I'm driving. The one that Alex is driving hasn't, so he's going to get a wet backside. I just like things that look good. Jeep looks better with the roof down. Peter's youngest son, Leon, has also caught the family history bug. So this, is, uh, this is for Alex. He said uh, he doesn't really dress up, so uh, gone inside, found a helmet for him to wear. This is the original one, this one. This is what the Americans would have wore. Leon will be going the whole hog. I've got my own um, British Airborne uniform, so I'll wear that over there. Got all the all the kit that goes around the waist. I've got, got, got a couple of parabikes as well, the BSA folding bikes, which the British Airborne used to use. They fold them up, put them on their backs, and a pin down there, and they would, they would jump jump with them. But is this Linda's idea of a family holiday? No, it's every day. This is a continuation of at home, pouring petrol into jeeps. I'm staying at home and holding the fort at home with my older son Aaron while he does his exams. It's quite it's quite a nice experience. Boys have been going since since they were down here, you know, so um, yeah, it's just a, a way of life with us, a Normandy, a more Normandy trip. But just how many toys can they fit on the truck? He should be gone 10 minutes ago. The Jeeps are cleaned and fastened. Basically. The bikes are loaded up, the engine's on. And it's time for the Monk family vacation to get underway. Next stop, the beaches of Normandy. On 4 June, the weather forecast for D-Day caused grave concern. D-Day was postponed 24 hours to 6 June. Will history repeat itself for the Biggin Hill team? It's touch and go whether Peter will have his fighter escort joining him in Normandy or not. The aircraft is ready. We are ready to go. We just hope the weather is going to be in our favour. In Normandy, people and machines are gathering in the streets and on the beaches. It's the biggest celebration of D-Day for 25 years. 1940s uniforms outnumber civvies. And world leaders are flying in making it even harder for veteran aircraft to get over here. I need to uh, contact the pilot, Don, back at Biggin Hill to see where we are with bringing over the Spitfire and uh, meeting up with the Dakotas. There's weather issues and also restricted airspaces uh, issues this morning. 
Peter and his sons are heading inland to one of the most important D-Day sites, Pegasus Bridge. It was here that the first attack of D-Day took place just after midnight on the 6th of June. 181 men in six gliders landed yards from the bridge, captured it in just 10 minutes and held it until reinforcements arrived. Many were just a few years older than Leon is today and they're remembered here with great reverence. It is a pilgrimage. The majority of people here have relatives that, um, that took part in the Normandy invasion. So, um, you know, they, they continue to, you know, they keep, they help keep the memory of all this alive and it's very important. So um, we need it all to come together. We've got the vehicles, uh, they're here. We just need the aeroplane now. Back at Biggin Hill, MJ772 is refueled and ready for action, if the weather gods allow. At Duxford, the Dakotas are also waiting for the all clear. Over 200 paratroopers are getting ready, including two D-Day veterans, Harry Reid and John Hutton. Thanks, eh? Well, I'm now 95, and uh, I've been talked into doing a one last parachute descent. I was only 19 then, so all I wanted to do was do something exciting, you know. I came here out of, out of a promise I made to my mates who are very dear now. The modern paratroopers are kitted out exactly as their counterparts were in June 1944. With the weather closing in, it's now or never. And the Dakotas are go. 21 planes and 240 paratroopers take to the air. But where is their fighter escort? Hello, Peter. Hi, Don. What's the latest on the weather then? The weather at the moment is it's slowly closing in. Down to the southeast. So basically from about one o'clock onwards. The western edge of the French coast down from Calais down past the two Ks pretty much covered in heavy showers. Well, unfortunately then, Don, in that case, um, we'll scrub it. OK, all right then, I'll let everybody know here. I mean, it's disappointing, obviously. Absolutely, and the airspace restrictions haven't helped either, have they? So, all right. Scrubbed. The, uh, they're just in the big enough window to get the aeroplane over and back. Weather tomorrow is just as bad, so... And uh, getting worse on Friday, it's going to be awful, so we scrubbed it. But the 75th anniversary of D-Day must go on. In the early hours of June the 6th, paratroopers landed to take control of key positions. At 5 a.m., Allied ships started pounding German coastal defences, covering the approach of the landing craft. At 6.30 a.m., H hour, the barrage stopped and the first Allied troops landed on five Normandy beaches. Spitfires and typhoons flew overhead, defending the airspace and launching ground attacks on fortified positions. Thousands died, but the beaches were secured. Operation Overlord had begun. At 8.25 that morning, Peter's Uncle Fred, with the Suffolk Regiment, landed on Sword Beach. In the British sector, special duty engineers hit the beach first with the medics and infantry following. Fred Monk's first objective was to take a gun battery in a nearby village. In commemoration of the liberation of Colville by the British Army on the 6th of June, 1944. Peter visits the site of the attack every year. When he comes over here, it's not just Fred he thinks about that um, was killed, it's, what, it's all the others that came up the beach. The landing craft went down and there was no cover. And sometimes the landing craft door didn't come down and they were shot, being shot. 
the museum's closed today, but you can see from here, there's a plaque on the wall and the, our relative Private Fred Monk is actually named on that plaque. There were 10 soldiers killed here trying to take this um, strong point on the 6th of June. Fred was killed here just a few hours after the landing. I find it quite moving, to be honest with you. It's, um, the more I look at it every time I come back here and, and, and read this little piece about what happened. We've got a relative that's, that's buried over here and we know the story behind his uh, demise, sad demise. So the, the Normandy pilgrimage for us means a hell of a lot more. With or without the, the Spitfire aircraft, we're still here anyway and to pay homage to our relative, which is very important to us. Late in the afternoon, the Dakotas are nearing Normandy. Thousands have gathered to watch. I'm very surprised we haven't been able to see any yet. There's three over there, look, in close, close-ish formation. Oh, there's, yeah, there's three more. There you go. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're close. Yeah. Yep. There's another one. If you, yeah, if you have a look, there's two and more. three more out to see. In the early hours of D-Day, 815 Dakotas arrived in France. Flying low to avoid radar, some were shot down. Twenty-four thousand paratroopers dropped from the skies. Landing deep inside enemy territory, many were instantly hit by machine gun fire. Troopers fought throughout the night, preparing the way for the amphibious invasion. Brutal work in complete darkness. 95 year old Harry Reid was one of them. Of nearly 12,000 Allied aircraft, 127 were shot down. On the ground, Fred Monk was one of 4,400 Allied servicemen who died that day. But the Nazis' grip on Europe had been loosened. And in the hands of the Free French Squadron, the work of Peter's D-Day Spitfire had just begun. <laughs> <laughs> 